Good afternoon, my name is Devin Carbato and I'm a professor of law here at the law school and a faculty member in the Critical Race Studies program and it's my uh, distinct pleasure to moderate this particular panel entitled Colorblind Consequences. And it seems to me that we can't have a meaningful conversation about colorblind consequences without thinking concretely about the discursive terms upon which colorblindness actually comes into being. And roughly articulated, there are two dynamics about which we should be concerned. One dynamic we might call the racial alignment dynamic. The other dynamic we might refer to as the oppositional racial duality dynamic. That sounds terribly abstract, I know, so I want to be very concrete about what I might mean. So with respect to racial alignment, what I have in mind is the following. Color blindness is aligned with Race blindness is aligned with assimilation, is aligned with race neutrality, is aligned with notions of sameness. These ideas tend to travel together ideologically on the one hand, and then they're oppositionally positioned against another set of ideas. So color blindness is oppositional to color consciousness, race blindness is oppositional to race consciousness, well, I'm taking them up instead of putting them on. <laughs> Assimilation is um, uh, oppositional to multiculturalism and uh, race neutrality, oppositional to racial preference. Sameness is oppositional to diversity. You get the general idea, I think. This ideological structure, I want to suggest, has a number of different effects that I will mark as a point of departure for introducing our panelists. There are four quick effects that I want to identify. One effect is framing. The other effect is thinking about the ways in which this structure impacts metrics of discrimination, that is to say, the way in which we measure discrimination. We might think about effects on the ways in which colorblindness is uh, expressed, and we might think about domain effects as well. So let's think first about framing. And with respect to framing, I want us to think about this particular scale. It's an admission scale, and what you'll notice immediately is that it's perfectly, perfectly balanced. What disrupts this balance? Enter the big thumb of affirmative action. Right? It's not just a thumb, it's a very big thumb, and it creates an imbalance, and the reason, again, it creates an imbalance is directly related to the ideological structure with which I began. Now, of course, that's not the only way to think about admissions. You could have another frame in mind. You could say, for example, that the scale is already tilted because of a number of social effects, including the ones that I've listed there. Indeed, you could say that even when you put the so-called thumb on the scale, it remains the case that the scale is tipped in a particular way as a result of K-12 education, stereotype threat, and again, the other dynamics that are listed there. So one of the issues that we have to think about with respect to affirmative action, it seems to me, is how it is framed as a result of that particular structure. And lots of people in this room have done enormous work helping us think through that particular framing. Another dynamic we might think about is metrics of discrimination. So I have one particular uh, schematic that might help us think through that. And a simple question is this. How does, for example, colorblindness affect what we might call stereotype endorsement? And does it affect it in a positive or a negative way? How does colorblindness affect implicit bias? Does implicit bias go up or down? If we change it to color consciousness, we can ask a set of questions again. Multiculturalism, we can ask a set of questions once again. The issue is how do certain ideologies shape metrics of discrimination? I simply have two uh, very discrete dynamics there. What about mechanisms for expressing colorblindness? There are a number of mechanisms that we might have in mind. We could think about the expression of colorblindness at the individual or personal level. 
we could think about expression of colorblindness at the level of institutional norm or governance structures. And with respect to institutional norms or governance structures, we could have three levels. One is the so-called soft level, where in a particular employment context, for example, the employees might simply be saying, we don't really see race. We could have an in-between norm where the notion is that there are diversity statements that circulate within the institutional context. We could have a harder mechanism, that is to say, diversity training, and you'll hear a lot about diversity training here today, particularly as it's applied in the context of uh, policing. We could think about the mechanism of expression in terms of legal mandates, and there are a number of different legal mandates that we might have in mind, state initiatives such as Proposition 209, statutory regimes, constitutional law, and we could ask a question about whether um, colorblindness is being communicated or expressed implicitly or explicitly, and with respect to that, some of you might remember this particular cartoon which generated an awful lot of controversy. So one question to pose with respect to this particular image is, is it express racial consciousness or implied racial consciousness? Is it express colorblindness or implied colorblindness? I don't know that there's an easy way to answer that question, but presumably we're concerned about whether or not colorblindness and color consciousness are expressed explicitly or implicitly. Finally, we might think about domain effects. And there are a number of domains that we might be thinking about. One is just everyday social, personal interactions. And we could think about them in terms of white on white, non-white on non-white, or white on non-white. How we experience color blindness, color consciousness, etc., might be a function of the specific identity configuration in which the interaction is taking place. We could talk about the emotional as a domain. Let's talk about anger, predicate race anger. What about happiness, race happiness? What about guilt, innocence, comfort, and to rip an idea that Neil introduced, pleasure. What about race pleasure? These are different ways in which race is experienced, and certainly we can think about them as a domain. Clearly we can think about the workplace as a domain, along notions of hiring, promotion, and pay equity. And finally, policing and politics are two additional domains that we might have in mind. And if we're going to think about politics, we'll show Obama yet again. <laughs> <laughs> Obama can't disappear from this conference. He's always already here, right? He really is uh, the elephant, or perhaps not, is there. And so, with respect to Obama, the effects question might be this. Is the Obama moment an effect of color consciousness? Is it the instantiation of color, color consciousness? Is it the effect of race consciousness? These are some of the issues that we will take up. So, the panel roughly is organized in what I will call four acts. Act one, I refer to as color blindness is bad. Dash, dash, very, very bad. <laughs> <laughs> or, to put it the way Professor Howie Wynott might quote, color blindness is utterly, underscore, utterly incompatible and willfully blind to the realities of racism. Professor Wynott is a professor of sociology at UC Santa Barbara. He's written a number of enormously influential books, including Racial Formation with Michael Omi and The World is a Ghetto. Part of his project of late is to think about the way in which colorblindness and its deployment might shape how we inhabit our racial identities. That is to say, one of the effects of colorblindness is how it positions us vis-a-vis -vis how we occupy race. He might get us to think about the question of whether or not we can exercise what he calls race conscious agency to contest the hegemony of colorblindness. So let me start then with Professor Howie Wynette. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Devin. I am so excited to be here again. It's, uh, just a fantastic experience to be immersed in the kinds of discussions we're having. Uh, the, the previous panel just set off a, a bunch of, of thought, and Devin's uh, introduction, overall introduction, not to me particularly, uh, also, I think, extremely stimulating. 
Uh, so it's just a few minutes and trying not to trip out, which I'm very I'm definitely known to do. Uh, I want to deal with colorblindness as a racial formation project. I want to talk about the uh, two, what I see as the two major dimensions of colorblindness. One, a sort of a, a larger social structural dimension, which I, I think we, we began to touch on last time with Gary's talk and some other talks, uh, Neil's talk. Um, and then I also want to talk about colorblindness as an, uh, at the experiential level, that is, a, 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 the, uh, as a racial p formation project in li lived experience. Um, colorblindness constitutes a kind, it can be, I mean, itself contains these huge contradictions. I mean, uh, Devin already uh, hints, at, hints at that, or more than hints at it. We can definitely see it as a kind of racism light, and we can also see see it as a as an anti-racism light. You know, I don't see color; a person just a person to me. I deal with everyone on their merits. That's what many of uh, our students tell us. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, structural, the social structural dimensions of colorblindness of the colorblind racial project. I think we should remember how we're situated, not only at ground zero, but in a certain way at time zero. That has come up before too, uh, that we're in a very transitional moment, very liminal racial moment. Um, colorblindness on a structural level can be seen as an effort to achieve, uh, of the U.S. racial regime, looking just at the U.S., to achieve or restore racial hegemony in the aftermath of the civil rights movement and the larger sense of civil rights movement, i.e. black power, brown power, yellow power, etc. included. Um, as Gramsci points out, or as we understand hegemony, it involves incorporating opposition. That's the crucial element in going from a domination, an oppression dynamic, to a hegemonic dynamic, making concessions in order to defuse opposition. Um, getting the opposition to accept concessions. So that means you have to make enough, you as the racial regime, have to make enough concessions so that acceptance is possible. They can't be purely symbolic, they can't be purely window dressing, they have to be real concessions. At the same time, hegemony has this big dialectical side, which is that it, um, in order to be incorporated, the opposition wants to demand as high a price as possible. So there's a um, transformation of the state dimension, transformation of the regime, the racial regime, let's call it, dimension of hegemony. Getting the most justice, getting the best deal, getting the greatest possible equality. It's striking, uh, thinking back to the last panel for just a moment, it's striking how effectively the movement was contained by this hegemonic transformation. Um, I was just talking to Devin in the break, the work of, uh, I'm not a political scientist, but the work of uh, political scientists who worked on uh, 1960s racial dynamics, Robert Lieberman particularly is a, a name that comes to mind, who discusses at length the legislative process by which civil rights laws, voting rights acts, and so on were, uh, uh, were uh, hammered out in congressional committees and uh, uh, cloakroom negotiations and so on. Would it be, uh, this goes very close to what Gary was talking about, would it be criminal uh, to discriminate? No, no, it couldn't be criminal, it's got to be a civil problem. Well, if it's civil, what kind of um, remedy, what kind of tools are available to those who charge discrimination. Is there, uh, I mean, I'm not no lawyer either. Not, certainly no subpoena. Well, is there discovery? Well, under what terms, et cetera, et cetera. Those kinds of uh, discussions 
sharply limited the remedies for discrimination. Uh, the intent dimension that we have focused on already so much in ju jurisprudential um, uh, treatment of uh, discrimination um, is only one aspect of this larger process of containment, hege hegemonization, etc. Okay. Um, by this standard, though, with all these concessions that were made, with all these um, effective moves to incorporate the movement, the opposition, um, the colorblind theme, the co colorblind hegemonic project still has to be judged as failing. And I think that's something we really have to pay attention to. It's failing. Sure, it's the established rhetoric we hear on all sides, but think about the contradictions that are involved in colorblindness. I mean, we have to uh, 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 assume that we're all colorblind now, at the same time as we live out a racialized situation that's as uh, omnipresent as it ever was. Um, and beyond that, we have to note the kinds of shifts that are taking place in the racial present. Not only Obama, although the shift that Obama represents is, is re uh, remarking, uh, is an enormous shift, maybe partial, but still, it may be limited, but still enormous. But think also of the, um, uh, the, the dem demographic shifts that are happening in the United States. The transition to majority minority population. Latest projection, two, 2042, the U.S. tips to a majority minority society. California went about the year 2000. Under 30 U.S. population becomes majority minority in 2028. Okay, I. Mo moving very quickly, again, danger of tripping. That's, this, that's the structural side of colorblindness as a racial formation project in a very schematic way. Schem schematically, let's talk, at least for a moment, about the experiential dimensions of colorblindness as a racial formation project. I think we have to see it, colorblindness not as either racism light or anti-racism light, but as um, a, an effect as, a, as a, uh, a reduced version of the kind of racial agency, the range of racial agencies that are available to, to us today. Schematically, I'd offer three possible racial agencies. Now think about these as a repertory. Don't think about these as you have to be one thing or another. There's a denial version of racial agency. We inhabit, how do we inhabit our racial identities? We can deny our racial identities. Generally, that's associated with the right, with neoconservatism, maybe with the new right, but there are also more left-wing, Marxist, class-oriented, etc., versions of denial, i.e., of colorblindness. Second version, we ha can have a state-oriented version of our racial agency. That is, it's rights-based. We inhabit our raciality through a focus on our rights. Um, looking at the state, fulfilling the civil rights agenda, um, uh, obtaining full equality, full uh, inclusion, etc. Of course, Right, this is, fulfilling the civil rights agenda contains a certain ambiguity too. What is what was the civil rights agenda exactly? A third, a third version. I'm really truncating here. I got 30 seconds to go. There's a kind of a um, a creative action um, way of inhabiting our racial identities. I'm drawing here on the radical pragmatist tradition, the Deweyan tradition, 
Cornell West, other people, self-reflective action, think of self-reflective action, situated creativity, the ways, those are phrases from John Dewey, the ways that we recognize our racial situation and act upon it in the present. The idea that we're already navigating in a contradictory and crisis-ridden racial terrain. You remember Gramsci's definition of crisis was that the old has died, but the new cannot be born. And in this situation, Gramsci says, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. If we're living that, if we're living that in a situation where, yes, we have to some extent, limited but real, overcome the dynamics, the racist dynamics that have characterized the con Neil's constitutional racism that has structured our society from the very beginning. If we have to some extent overcome that, and I think it's arguable that we have at least to some extent done that, then that's the part that the old has died. But the other part is that race and racism retain their ubiquity. There's plenty of privilege, there's plenty of violence, stereotyping, exclusion. So in this situation, what is your racial practice? What is your race consciousness? What do you want your race consciousness to be? That's the creative action version of inhabiting our racial identities. Now just think for a moment of Obama also working this repertoire, this repertory, this repertoire, you know, at some points denying, at other points insisting on rights, at other points um, trying to engage in a uh, situated creativity of reinventing his racial practice. We, on our micro level, experiential level, are doing the same thing. So if Act 1 uh, is about colorblindness being bad, very bad, Act 2 is about diversity being good, very good. Professor Deirdre Boeing will help us perform this particular act. She is a professor of legal writing at the University of uh, Seattle School of Law. Her scholarship focuses on issues of judicial process as well as alternative ways of thinking about plea bargaining. Her recent work focuses on diversity in the domain of higher education and she's interested in exploring the extent to which the absence of diversity might produce racial hostility, racial stigma, and racial isolation. And this is particularly crucial in the context of affirmative action debates where the notion is that it's affirmative action that produces racial stigma, racial hostility, and racial isolation. So please join me in welcoming Professor Deirdre Bowen. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, if, um, if this was ground zero of the um, anti-affirmative action movement, Washington State was ground zero iteration one. Um, soon after Proposition 209 was passed, Proposition 200 passed. And um, much of the conversation in Washington State, again, referring to um, uh, Professor Crenshaw's idea that we have accents in which different um, modes of affirmative action gets articulated. In Washington State, um, I imagine that um, being a white majority uh, state, um, King County, where Seattle is located, is, um, I think it's probably fair to say, is majority white and not only that, self-congratulatory white. So it's a, um, it's a liberal um, enclave in an otherwise conservative state, but um, I imagine people thought that they were voting for um, something that they could celebrate, that we had achieved some sort of civil rights goal. And at the time, we had a governor who was Chinese American. We had um, a King County executive who was African American and a mayor who was African American. So initially, uh, when it passed, people, s and, and then we started to realize what was happening, people said, I didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't understand what I was voting for. Um, but I'm telling you that it's been 10 years and, and nobody's called in the cavalry to undo it. So um, that has led to um, a, a question that has come to mind for me, which is if the debate around affirmative action 
is one that is largely um, evaluative in terms of quantitative numbers, then um, I would like to understand why, from the affirmative action point of view, we talk about it in a quantitative way. And what I mean by that is when we evaluate the effects of anti-affirmative action, the conversation is about it's not that bad. In Washington State, we even point to enrollment numbers to show that they've gone up to um, pre-existing Proposition 200 numbers. The problem is, is that they weren't done correctly, and if you had controlled for the age of the population available to apply for school, you would realize quickly that they haven't gone back up. But having said that, the numbers are always pointed to as, look at the enrollments, um, everything's okay. But um, when we look at the conversation around affirmative action, it's not talked about in terms of numbers. It's talked about in terms of a qualitative experience, warning against what will happen to the underrepresented minorities who go to school in these locations. And that conversation takes place um, involving three propositions that are used by the anti-affirmative action movement, but then also have captured the imagination of um, the, the legal system. And, and the first proposition is that affirmative action is not an appropriate tool to deal with um, discrimination. And, and it may be that some people still acknowledge that there is discrimination, but it's, it's more often than not that people claim discrimination isn't a problem anymore. And I'm not quite sure how they decided in 1996 that it wasn't a problem anymore, or in 1998, it just sort of reminds me of President Bush going out to the carrier and saying, mission accomplished. I mean, you can say it, but um, it doesn't in any way mean that you've achieved what you've stated. So uh, the first proposition, it's not appropriate. The second proposition is, that if you allow for affirmative action, underrepresented minorities will experience both internal and external stigma. And then the third proposition is that um, there will be resentment by non-minority members in those institutions of higher education that adopt race-based admissions because of the belief that there are unqualified members present amongst them. So, I decided to test these hypotheses. And I test, tested these, um, these hypotheses um, uh, by comparing affirmative action states with anti-affirmative action states. But I decided not to just stop there. I also decided to look at the other side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is from um, an affirmative action point of view, one of the things that has gained traction, or this was not the original reason for affirmative action, but in a constant attempt to um, find an acceptable model for um, affirmative action, is the desire to create um, diversity in the classroom and create critical mass. And my question was, does affirmative in fact, action in fact do that, and, and is that beneficial? So. I asked that both of those questions, and um, I conducted a study of 335 underrepresented minorities at a conference um, that was designed for mentoring uh, high-achieving, underrepresented minorities in the sciences to, to groom them to go to graduate school and into um, professional degrees involving the hard sciences. And I conducted both a survey at this conference and also um, did some follow-up surveys to see, or excuse me, follow-up interviews to determine um, how some of the variables that I measured were, were articulated in concrete ways. And the results were um, as, as follows. When I compared, um, and, and I will say, first of all, that there were not um, representatives from all 50 states in, in the sample. So it includes 28 states and then the four states that at the time were, um, were anti or continue to be anti-affirmative action, although we now know we have to add Nebraska to the list. So Washington, California, Michigan, and Florida make up the, the sample of anti-affirmative action states. And what we find is that um, when you look at measures for internal stigma and external stigma, that there is a much larger proportion of, it, of students reporting both internal and external stigma in those states that ban race-based admissions. So I want to repeat that to you, that in those states that ban race-based admissions, there's higher rates of both internal stigma and external stigma. Um, on the other question, uh, the idea of resentment, 
I measured hostility by reports of um, overt racism that the students had experienced either by faculty or students. And again, there is much higher rates of overt racism reported in states that ban affirmative action. So if we stop for a second, this data suggests that um, the hypotheses promoted by the anti-affirmative action group are not in fact supported. Um, how, how about the other side of the coin? What happens um, when we look at the issue of critical mass? Can you achieve critical mass with affirmative action? And the answer is yes. In looking at um, the second uh, part of the question, in which I was comparing students who had never taken a class, never taken a class in which they were racially isolated with those students who had taken at least one class where they had been racially isolated, the results are in fact the starkest. Um, I want to put this in a, a positive light so I, I'm consistent with Devin's theme that diversity is good um, rather than focusing on the racially isolated group. Um, those students who have never taken a class in which they were the sole minority report the lowest rates of overt racism. They report the lowest rates of internal stigma and the lowest rates of external stigma. So um, let me be also clear that those rates are even lower than just generally those students who are in um, uh, affirmative action states. And in fact, when you correlate where are students who are racially isolated, I think it comes as no surprise that the highest correlation in the study is between racial isolation and going to school in a state that bans affirmative action. And then conversely, you're more likely to see students in, um, who, are, who are, have never been racially isolated in states that, uh, are, are, um, that allow for race-based admissions. So the results are, are pretty powerful in suggesting that critical mass um, is potentially available. I mean, our, our next question has to be what exactly is critical mass, but at, at least a baseline, um, we, we know that if we can avoid racial isolation based on our previous um, panel's conversation, that that's, a, that's a good thing, and that's more likely to happen in affirmative action. Um, the, the next thing that I, that I looked at um, dealt with um, once students had experience going to school in an affirmative action state versus an anti-affirmative action state, what factors were they contemplated, contemplating as they considered graduate school? And again, over 95% of the students in the sample did plan on going to graduate school. And the most remarkable thing is that students in anti-affirmative action states were much more um, interested in seeking out um, a graduate school's policy on um, race-based admissions for the purpose of finding schools that did have race-based admissions so that they could exit um, those hostile locations that they had experienced for their undergraduate careers um, and find a more friendly environment. Um, so one of the things that, that we might think about in, in using this data is, um, first of all, um, when we, I, I would want to first make clear that I did not say that there wasn't racism, overt racism in, in affirmative action states or that there wasn't internal and external stigma. Um, it's, it's lower. So the question that, um, rate that that raises for me is how then do students in affirmative action states manage their hostility. So we might actually end up with an experience in which underrepresented minorities have a more positive experience, but I'm not sure that it results in a more positive experience in terms of shaking up the racial hier hierarchy in life in general. Are we just creating a situation where everybody's um, um, managing their hostility and in, in a different way. Um, the second thing that this raises 
is um, how courts in particular should think about how they decide cases involving, and again, as, as, as I'm concerned, more states will be using um, these, these propositions, how they interpret what color blindness is to reduce the hostility and the, the stigma that will no doubt accompany um, the passage of these propositions. Thank you. from Act 2, where diversity is good, to Act 3, where diversity is bad. So Professor Phil Guff will help us enact this particular <laughs> script. He'll think about diversity in a particular context, that is to say, training in the domain of policing. Professor Guff is an assistant professor of social psychology at UCLA, and we were very thrilled to welcome him to the UCLA community. His work focuses on the extent to which we might think about disparate racial <coughs> results, not just a function of individual attributes of particular individuals, but as a function of environmental factors as well. And again, today he'll help us think through why it might be the case that diversity training, something we might think of as being good, can actually produce perverse effects in the context of policing. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gough. Well, I, I hope that nobody will hold me to the dynamism of uh, Devin's introduction, uh, nor to the idea that diversity is bad and I'm going to prove it. Um, <clears throat> those of you who know me know that I'm a bit of a storyteller, um, and as you see the, the lack of notes in front of me, there's a story to explain it, and, and I think it's an interesting metaphor to, to begin with. Um, so last night, uh, I got on a plane. I was supposed to get on a plane yesterday afternoon, but last night I got on a plane. Um, and uh, as a result of having been delayed uh, many hours in JFK, um, I was hungry by the time we got to about hour three from JFK to LAX. So I decided to purchase one of the sandwiches that was very reasonably priced at, at $57. Um, <clears throat> it was a, the, the one sandwich they had, a uh, turkey sandwich with... Uh, with a leafy green and tomato. Um, and I saw that several other people in my row had, had enjoyed theirs already, um, in the sense that they didn't grimace terribly when they were eating it. Um, <clears throat> so I ordered one. And about mid-bite into the second half of the sandwich, uh, a voice came over the loudspeaker um, and said, if you have ordered a sandwich and are still eating it, please put it down. Um, that, I've never had anything like this ever happen to me, at, so at least not in a plane. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it was, it was explained that there had been people who had had uh, discomfort uh, as a result of having ordered the sandwich. I think it wasn't the ordering, but the eating, but still. Um, and so I, d I did put it down. I ordered the, the cheese cracker snack instead to see if I could get my fill. Um, and then after arriving at 1.30 in the morning at the hotel, spent a good deal uh, of time. I, those of you who know me also know that I'm a religious man, so I, I prayed to the porcelain god for a little while. Um, <laughs> I think that this is sort of as diversity training, a metaphor for diversity training and for colorblindness and for post-raciality is, is an interesting metaphor in the sense that, that sort of diversity training in a colorblind world is the toxins that we pay for but we didn't know we were getting and for which there can really be no compensation. Um, we were all offered our, our $57 back, but I'm telling you that was not nearly enough to get me to go through this again. That The fact that it was free was not really a, a promise. So um, that's also by way of justifying the, the bit of, of scattering shot that I'm going to uh, be doing, trying to wear three hats, not just a social psychologist uh, who works with police, but the, the first hat being the son of a philosopher, um, and I'll apologize for that up front. Um, the second hat being um, a, a social psychologist who studies uh, sort of ways in which we conceptualize of, of diversity and what impacts that hat has. And the third hat is the, is the newest fashion hat, which is I am now the executive director of research for the Consortium for Police Leadership in Equity. Um, you can find us at www.policingequity.com. Org, um, which makes us sound and look really official. Um, they, the, luckily, the webpage doesn't show the, the masking tape and the, uh, the um, <coughs> chewing gum with which the organization is put together. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the consortium and I think the, the interesting uh, opportunities we have with that as I get to that portion. Um, in trying to think about how I'm going to put all this together um, with, with my three hats, I thought I would start with the son of, a, of the philosopher and talk about the difference between ideal theory and non-ideal theory um, as a philosopher's child. So for those of you who are uninitiated who didn't have Plato's Republic um, at your father's knee uh, at the dinner table at age three or four, um, ideal theory is what we're used to seeing from traditional um, liberal moral and political philosophy uh, in the Western tradition. Right? That is, the world as it should be. 
Okay? And when we think about colorblindness in the, the words of King, when we talk King's colorblindness, um, the traditional interpretation is that, well, King was good, and colorblindness for King, therefore, was good. And when he said, uh, you know, I may not get there with you, but the mountaintop I'm talking about is where, you know, black children and white children, Jews and Gentiles, will be able to be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. That's ideal. That's not what we should be doing right now in order to get there. Right? That's the ideal. And we can learn a great deal from what the ideal should be. Right? So if we understand what we should be striving towards, then that's really the only way we can develop a roadmap to get there. <clears throat> Colorblindness as non-ideal theory, right? and again, I'm talking about in, in a uh, philosophy context, is non-ideal theory generally is this is how we deal with an imperfect world and how we would go about making it better. Okay? Colorblindness in a non-ideal theory is, ironically, non-ideal. Right, because this is what says, all right, so since that's what we're trying to get to, let's just act like we're there now, and that's the best way to get there. You know, the sort of, um, sort of faulty syllogism that you can't fix discrimination with discrimination, therefore we should act like we're colorblind right now. And that's, I think, a lot of the, these, these two different facets of colorblindness that we've talked about so far today, and I'm expecting to talk about a good deal tomorrow. I just put philosophy stamps on it, ideal and non-ideal theory. <clears throat> um, I want to trouble that a bit because the idea has been that ideal theory is okay, non-ideal theory is not okay. Really? Already? That, that sandwich story took a long time. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, and that, that non-ideal theory is not okay because it leads to a sort of violence, a kind of erasure um, that then perpetuates um, racial uh, discrimination. I, I'd say that the ideal theory was a bit troubling as well. Um, but I also would, would trouble the idea that that's what King was using. That, it, I, that colorblindness as a progressive tool has always only and already been a pragmatic approach to white responses to the reality of diversity. Okay, um, I, unlike Kim, feel sort of liberated um, from the PowerPoint, so I'll just tell stories about the research and then get to the, um, the policing context. Um, we essentially were looking at um, the ways in which people, for a number of years, at the ways in which people talked about diversity. Um, I think that uh, you know, the work of Evan and his colleagues, uh, Mike Norton and Sam Summers, have been fantastic at looking at the way that people don't like to talk about uh, diversity. And when I say people, I'm talking about white people. Um, <clears throat> but we were interested in what they actually do talk about when they're forced to. So we had this interesting program at Penn State where I was when we started this research um, that was uh, uh, called the Race Relations Project. Right? It was a Socratic style dialogue led, led by students. I called it the FUBU of diversity trainings because it was for the students, by the students. Um, those of you who were there get me. Everybody else is just thinking about jumpsuits. It's fine. Um, <clears throat> And uh, essentially what it did was it brought a group of mostly white students, if you've ever seen Penn State uh, in a fo the football context, that's a scary, scary scenario of a large group of white people painted in white chanting in unison. Um, and that was my experience, Deidre, you kind of reminded me of my experience at, at Penn State. Um, <clears throat> But so a large group of white students uh, in a room, sometimes with one black person, sometimes with no black people, um, talking about diversity issues. So we just watched these 90-minute videotapes. We watched probably about uh, 153, give or take, except that's the exact number. We watched 153 90-minute interviews or, or, or group uh, therapy sessions, um, diversity sessions, um, just to see what themes came up. Um, and as traumatic as it was to watch them, it was also tremendously instructive. Uh, there were two themes that we, we really sort of latched onto, and we, we gave them names. Um, one theme um, we called intergroup analogy, which was when, uh, and I'll use the, the sort of stereotypic example, uh, we had a blonde woman in a particular uh, session who said, you should laugh, black man, the one black man in the, in the, in the group, at black jokes the way I laugh at, laugh at, at blonde jokes. <laughs> the black individual says, well, is being black the same thing as being blonde? And she says, well, yes. People think that you're not as smart as a white race, and I'm not as smart as a non black It's the same thing. And we were stunned. Um, and if I showed you the videotape, there would be raucous laughter. Um, <clears throat> but um, it also sort of revealed a, a reality of, of the ways in which these conversations are had. Right? Intergroup analogy is an interesting thing, because analogy foregrounds similarity, backgrounds or erases dissimilarity. And the case of comparing two social groups, dissimilarity is usually issues of history and power. So spontaneously, our uninitiated white undergraduates were employing a discourse strategy that was designed to insulate themselves from arguments of, you know, or accusations of racism, right? <clears throat> because if we are the same and our history and power are not on the table, then we have no history and power of us having a historical power over you. 
The second discourse strategy um, was, now we, we struggled for a long time dis describing it and naming it. Because um, essentially it was saying it's bad to talk about race. It's bad when you even use the categorization. It was almost a uh, characterization or a caricature of Stephen Colbert. I, I don't see race. People tell me I'm white and I believe them because I have Casey and the Sunshine Band in the, in the car. Um, <clears throat> but we have since dubbed it, since the election of Obama, post-racial assertions. Right, this violence of a race are taken to a new height that not only are we color blind, but now it's bad to talk about those those terrible old days when we were color conscious. Okay, um, I'll skip skip straight to the end. Stereotype threat for whites: the concern that whites will be seen as racist. And I'm, I'm interested in, in the kind of conversation we were having at the last panel. I think this this bridges and overlaps interestingly. Um, predicted the use of these discourse strategies. In situations where whites were concerned they were going to be seen as racist, they were more likely to use them. In all white settings, where they were less concerned about, they were less likely to use them. Also, the increase of discourse strategies, this sort of post-racial assertion and intergroup analogy, was negatively correlated with mentions of history and mentions of power. So it's not that, well, we were trying to establish common ground, right? We also measured you know, the individual differences in the degree to which people wanted to establish things like common ground. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't that so much as it was an avoidance of this threat. Okay, How does this relate to police violence, which is the thing that I've been studying for the last two years? In 30 seconds, I'm sure I'll be able to, to cover it fully. Um, we've been doing, we've had, uh, this, the consortium uh, is a new initiative that allows uh, researchers to get essentially unfettered access to police records and police officers. What we've been doing for the last two years is doing research on officers and linking individual officer psychological data to their history of use of force, stops, everything. So um, all of their demographics, their complaint history, their disciplinary history, their performance evaluations, um, favorite food, we got you know, Larry's a cancer, he likes long walks on the beach and fireside chats and sushi, all of that stuff we have as well as their psychological profile. So for the first time we can really look at the association between racial prejudice and discriminatory behavior. But the other part, portion of it, and the part that I was supposed to be talking about um, in the next 10 seconds, is that we got to do pre and post tests on academy recruits, pre-diversity training and post-diversity training. We also did a critical look at what the diversity training was. Now, the diversity training, interestingly, is they say, first thing to do, establish common ground. How do they establish common ground? They establish common ground with those very same discourse strategies that our undergraduates were using, which also lets you know how advanced diversity training is in terms of, of what they're telling the police officers. It's about as advanced as uninitiated undergraduates who for the first time are talking about race ever in central Pennsylvania. <laughs> now, how does that lead to increases in violence, which is the thing that I'm really interested in? Well, I'll, I'll leave you sort of with these two bits of information. Um, when we were looking at disparate use of force towards African Americans, the number one predictor was not racial prejudice, right? Number two predictor was insecure masculinity, which is a whole other conversation that we'll have another day. But number one was the threat, the threat that they would be seen as racist. Okay, why? In officer safety training, you are told that the number one most important thing to preserve your safety and other safety is you must control the situation. Only way to do that is you got two kinds of authority, moral authority and physical authority. Moral authority is I wear this itchy blue uniform, I've got the badge, I am the law, I respect my authority. Um, <laughs> and most of us do in fact do that. But in part it's because of the threat of the second kind of authority. If I'm a police officer, regardless of how altruistic and progressive I am, and I see a car full of African Americans who I, I just know they're going to think I'm racist, what happens to my moral authority? It's gone. The only authority I have left is physical authority. Now even if I start, and it's a good target, it's one, it's one of those you know, good black people who's never done drugs and wears a suit, three pieces even. Um, <clears throat> if I begin under threat and my only tool is, hey, I'm just like you, I'm blonde, guess what? That's going to become racially uncomfortable in a whole lot, a whole lot faster than it would need to. And at the point where it becomes racially uncomfortable, you see escalations in physical violence. Okay? So in fact, the colorblindness and post-raciality that we are teaching even to our undergraduates, right, even as ideal theory, has the ironic and unintended consequence of leading to black people going to the hospital when they talk to the cops. Okay? I want to leave you with this just one last little bit um, of, of sort of a context for the policing bit, as I've done my philosophy hat, my social scientist hat. 
1996, the International Association of Chiefs of Police uh, issued a report on police brutality. Not racial bias, but police brutality. Police brutality. Um, number one line, my favorite line to it, it says, essentially, we know nothing about police brutality. And that's because there have been no data collected. Police departments have not, sort of, in a comparative way, allowed that kind of access. In 2001, after having done uh, as, as good a study as there exists on police brutality for the past 10 years, so from 1991 to 2001, the ICP report, uh, uh, issued a second report in conjunction with the National Institute for Justice, which is our Department of Justice on the federal level. My favorite quote from that one is, essentially, we know nothing about police brutality. So as we move forward talking about colorblindness and, and my favorite topic, which is violence, because it's fun to talk about at cocktail parties, um, as we move forward in that, I think it's also important to see what we actually have been blind to in the sense that we haven't been able to get access to it. We literally know nothing about some of these areas where we, we sort of think that race has been important. We, we know in an anecdotal form that race has been important, but there hasn't been enough of a push in documenting it. I'm thinking particularly, Kevin, of, of your comment earlier where people said, well, I'm not sure if I'm even supposed to be taking count of this. You know, Prop 54, which thankfully failed, right, which was an, an ordinance to say we can't even keep, count, keep track of this. This may be the true threat of post-raciality, that we lose the ability to talk about where race actually matters. I'm way over my time, so I'll stop talking. I know acts will unfold in two parts by Professor Miguel Unzueta and Professor Victoria Plout. Professor um, Unzueta is an assistant professor of human resources and organizational behavior at UCLA's Anderson School of Business. And Part of his research focuses on the extent to which dominant groups conceive of uh, race-related issues, how dominant groups, that is, conceive of race-related issues, including but not limited to issues involving affirmative action and diversity. Professor Victoria Routes is an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Georgia. Her focus is on the ways in which modes of racial uh, discourse, including, again, uh, diversity and colorblindness, shape intergroup relations. We will call this act, Act 4, diversity equals good, it depends, exclamation marks, colorblindness equals bad, it depends, question mark. Uh, please join me in welcoming first Professor Zueta. I hope you'll uh, forgive me uh, that it's not my PowerPoint. But, uh, it's not. Forgive you for another Obama slide? Um, um, I have an Obama mention in my talk. <coughs> no question, but he, he may come up at the end. So I hope you forgive me. I, I am unable to free myself of the uh, training wheels of PowerPoint. I do, after all, teach in a business school. And that's just the way we communicate. <laughs> So today I'm presenting uh, one research study from a series of studies that I've been conducting uh, in my time here um, at UCLA. And specifically what I'm interested in exploring is how the effect uh, of exposure to either colorblind or multicultural ideology affects the perceptions people form about stereotypic or counter-stereotypic um, targets. Um, one thing uh, that I am able to do, uh, uh, thanks to psychological methodology, is I am able to put unsuspecting undergraduates into either a multicultural or a colorblind mindset. And the way we do that is by borrowing materials uh, from previous researchers who have developed uh, these kinds of primes. So imagine you are an undergraduate student who takes part in one of my studies and that you are randomly assigned to take part or, or to be in a colorblind uh, mindset. What we would do is we would expose you to a short paragraph describing the basic tenets of colorblindness. So you would read a paragraph that includes this kind of information. So in order to overcome interethnic conflict, we must remember that we are all first and foremost human beings. We're not independent factions, but rather part of a larger whole. Uh, you're further told that social sciences encourage us to look beyond skin color and, and to see that at the core, we're all really the same. So this is sort of a greatest hits of the tenets of colorblind. <laughs> and what ends up happening is if you're asked to read this and read it carefully uh, as an unsuspecting uh, subject, you tend to at least temporarily think 
in, in colorblind terms. Now to contrast that, uh, I want you to, to see this colorblind prime. So here is a greatest hits of, of, uh, of multicultural ideology. If you were in this condition, you would read that we are in the unique position of having many different cultural groups living within our borders. Uh, this could be a great asset because different cultural groups bring uh, uh, different perspectives to life uh, in terms of solving strategies, problem solving, etc. You'd also be told that social scientists argue that the ability to recognize these unique social characteristics uh, allows us to create smoother uh, in group interactions. So again, you simply get the basic tenets of multiculturalism when you're exposed to this kind of prime. Now the research question that I'm asking is what effect does exposure to either of these ideologies have on the way you perceive either stereotypic or counter-stereotypic targets? And by stereotypic, I'm referring to an individual who possesses characteristics that are uh, typical uh, of their particular racial in-group. So you can think of an African-American who enjoys hip-hop music. That would be considered stereotypic. In contrast, a counter-stereotypic target is one who possesses characteristics that are associated with a racial outgroup. So an African-American who uh, perhaps likes country music would be considered counter-stereotypic. And so I'm interested in seeing how these diversity ideologies affect uh, the perceptions people hold of either stereotypic or counter-stereotypic targets. And before I get to the materials, let me uh, show you what I am expecting um, to find. Uh, given that multiculturalism uh, tends to play up the fact that there are real and meaningful differences out there in society, but that these are a good thing, I'm expecting that multiculturalism may create a preference for targets that are deemed to be stereotypical. In other words, these subjects uh, or these targets may be conceived as being able to be counted on for their diversity expertise, right? So if you are primed to think in multicultural terms, you may be primed to kind of expect people to, to be able to play the part uh, of the diversity that is relative to their group. Now in contrast, I'm expecting subjects who are primed with a colorblind ideology to express a preference for counter-stereotypic targets. And the reason for that is that I'm expecting um, individuals primed with a colorblind ideology uh, to express a preference for those who can transcend their racial group membership. So if you're able to take on uh, characteristics of not your racial in-group, but rather a racial out-group, this may provide evidence to the individual who has a colorblind ideology that in fact colorblindness is a tenable ideology and that that is the way people actually are. So it basically proves the ideology you were temporarily primed with. Um, very quickly, I want to go through the methods that I used. 122 UCLA undergrads. I do want to call myself out by admitting that this sample is overwhelmingly um, white and Asian American. That is sort of the reality of doing uh, research here at UCLA. I am currently running uh, studies where we try to recruit specifically Latino and African American subjects. So that, that is work to come. Um, the basic setup is you're exposed to either uh, a multicultural or a colorblind ideology like I, like I just showed you. I also had a control condition, which I'll talk about in just a bit. Um, and also, uh, the profile type is either a stereotypic or a counter-stereotypic target. Let me show you how I manipulated stereotypicality and counter-stereotypicality. So I used uh, the magic of uh, Facebook. Uh, I figure most undergrads are quite familiar with Facebook. Setup for the study is we're interested in the way that you form impressions of people based on their Facebook uh, uh, profiles. And so subjects are given a fake Facebook profile that contains the following information. It's an African-American uh, student, and he claims to enjoy activities that are stereotypic of his group. So in this case, it was uh, hip-hop music and basketball. And these were activities that were pre-tested as being highly stereotypic of African-Americans. In the counter-stereotypic condition, you'll notice the activities change to the activities. <laughs> I always get laughs on that one. Um, Pre-tests found that, uh, in fact, surfing and uh, country music or country dancing uh, were considered to be highly stereotypic of um, uh, whites uh, and, and not African Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not as strange to me. I am from Texas, so country music kind of everybody's kind of into it in some ways. So, but in California, uh, it works. <laughs> so anyway, and then the dependent variable of interest was how likable is this person? I used. Uh, uh, I believe it was a six-item scale uh, of likability. Basically, how positive or negative is your impression of this person? So let me show you the data uh, that gets at the effects of uh, these ideologies on the perceptions of stereotypic or counter-stereotypic others. So 
First thing to notice is in this control condition here, that is not actually a significant uh, difference. So the control condition just establishes a baseline in likability such that both the stereotypic and the counter-stereotypic target are equally likable when there is no inter-ethnic ideology crime. But notice what happens when people approach uh, uh, these, these, um, these Facebook profiles with a multicultural um, ideology in mind. So individuals who are thinking in terms of multiculturalism do tend to express a preference for the stereotypic um, target uh, relative to the counter stereotypic target, which again to me suggests that uh, multiculturalism may put people in, in a state where they are sort of looking for diversity experts or experts of their own particular in-group, which is one of the basic tenets of multiculturalism. In the colorblindness condition, we essentially reverse the effect such that uh, people who are in a colorblind mindset tend to express greater liking for the counter-stereotypic target relative to the stereotypic target. So the target who is seen as sort of transcending his own racial group by adopting uh, practices of the majority group is liked more in, in this particular condition, uh, which to me suggests that perhaps colorblindness sort of puts people in a mindset of trying to um, prove to themselves that colorblindness is a tenable ideology. Um, and, uh, that just shows that those comparisons were significant uh, and not in the control. So some quick conclusions. Uh, multiculturalism led to a greater liking of a stereotypic target relative to a counter um, stereotypic um, target. Uh, again, I suggest this may reflect a preference for quote unquote diversity experts, that is individuals who are highly uh, stereotypic, may be counted on uh, more for providing the benefits uh, of multiculturalism in the way the ideology was described in our studies. Uh, colorblindness leads to greater liking of a counter um, stereotypic target, which may suggest that people who are in a colorblind mindset, either experimentally or just on their own as an individual difference, they may have a preference for those individuals who are seen as quote unquote transcending race. Uh, and this might be a way of maintaining the belief that colorblindness is a real and tenable ideology. Uh, a couple of quick uh, implications. Uh, both multiculturalism and colorblindness have important and perhaps unintended um, consequences. And there's been other work which finds that on, on, on several other psychological variables, these ideologies um, also have important effects. Uh, with regards to the present study, it appears that multiculturalism in certain environments, it may create pressure uh, for members of minority groups to, in a way, educate minority outgroup members. So if you are walking into an overtly multicultural environment, this may create the expectation that you are going to get some kind of multicultural education from individuals that are deemed diverse or multicultural. And this could create uh, an unnecessary burden or an extra burden on these individuals to serve as educators of their own group. And it's also quite possible that in a situation where a minority group member is either unable or unwilling to share uh, uh, insider information on his or her own racial group, this may create a backlash where perhaps majority group members um, in a multicultural environment may feel shortchanged and that they're not getting uh, the education that multiculturalism <laughs> promised them by having diverse others around them. Um, I think more important though, uh, for colorblindness, a potential implication is that a colorblind prime or a colorblind mentality may create a, a situation where people seek out evidence or perhaps individuals who allow them to maintain the belief that we are in fact past race. Um, I, I find it interesting that um, there's been a lot of, of talk of how uh, Barack Obama is able to sort of transcend race. And I think to view that as a compliment, I think that has to come from an individual who perhaps explicitly or maybe just implicitly believes in the tenets of colorblind ideology. So to the extent you can transcend race and that that becomes a good thing, I think that is a, a phenomenon that is rooted in, in colorblind um, ideology. Um, also, I think a, a very important consequence of, of sort of seeking information or seeking individuals that allow you to maintain a belief that colorblindness or your colorblind ideology is real and, and a tenable way of, of, of living in the world, it may make you ignore uh, existing uh, racial inequality, uh, uh, whether it be uh, at the uh, individual level or perhaps at the institutional level, um, which is um, a source of inequality that um, it's hard to ignore, but it seems like people are quite adept at doing it anyway, and perhaps colorblind ideology may allow individuals to avoid noticing these uh, examples of how race continues to matter in, in the present day. Um, 
So finally, I just want to close by saying that the methodologies uh, that are being used by social psychologists to explore the intended and sometimes unintended consequences of having these ideologies um, could serve as a way uh, to try to identify all, all the, the various psychological uh, um, um, impacts that these ideologies can have on people in, in such a way may allow us to hopefully figure out a way to implement uh, whichever ideology it is we, we feel we need to, uh, to propagate out there in the world. Um, anyway, I'll just stop at that. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, first, um, thank you all for having me here. I'm, um, I feel very privileged uh, to be here today. I'm a social psychologist at the University of Georgia, so I feel privileged on multiple levels to be here. Um, I want to thank my collaborators, organizational psychologist Keisha Thomas um, at UGA, and also my graduate student Matt Gorin. Um, Keisha and I started the Center for Research and Engagement and Diversity at UGA, through which we ran the research that I'm going to talk about today. But first, before I go into that research, I want to talk about a tension that's been growing in U.S. workplaces, schools, universities, politics. Um, there's the Obama picture. See, I've got one, too. Um, and legal arena, a tension that social psychologist James Jones has called a new American dilemma. And that is this tension um, between uh, these two ideologies, multiculturalism, and um, colorblindness that have been um, invoked um, already in this um, panel. Um, so first, as an introduction to um, uh, one way to think about colorblindness, while it's true our employees are from different cultures, everyone is united in their dislike for the lobby painting. So differences don't matter. What's important is that we are all uh, joined in uh, disliking this colorful painting. <laughs> Um, this one embraces multiculturalism. A community is made up of dreams, ideas, and hard work. It is a blend of the ideals of men and women from diverse backgrounds, like woven threads in a colorful tapestry. Each new idea inspires us to work and grow within this diverse fabric called community. Um, so these two ideologies, I'm not the only one in social psychology or in other disciplines to, um, to examine them. I like to think about them as understandings or ideas and practices about how groups should relate to, include, and accommodate one another. And um, very broadly speaking, colorblindness could be defined as this idea that people are all the same and group differences are superficial and should be ignored and mi minimized. With multiculturalism, people may be different, and differences associated with identity should be acknowledged, valued, and included. And I do acknowledge that both of those are um, loaded with multiple meanings. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to talk about them um, as two broad models. Okay, previous research on consequences. What do social psychologists have to say about the co consequences of these models? Well, first of all, we know that colorblindness, for example, when people are primed with the essays that uh, Miguel so kindly inserted for me in his talk, um, that increases um, racial and ethnic bias. It does, it does increase implicit bias uh, relative to multiculturalism. Um, we also know from wonderful work by Eric Knowles, Brian Lowry, and their colleagues that individuals may actually use colorblindness to justify inequality and to maintain a system of inequality. Um, we also know that colorblindness predicts public policy voting behavior. I wanted to put these up here for you so you could get a flavor of what kinds of policies are endorsed by people who tend to um, endorse colorblindness. Public institutions shall not grant preferential treatment in school admissions, employment, hiring, or business con contracting to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin. And an amendment to the Constitution should be made that requires federal, state, and local governments to conduct business in English and not use other languages, even in places where many people don't speak English. With regard to treatment, and I understand that my notion of treatment is possibly different from the notion of treatment um, that you're used to, but by treatment, for example, um, as we saw in Evan's presentation, utilizing colorblindness can actually decrease um, the quality of interracial interaction with more social distancing, for example. 
and colorblindness in therapists, according to counseling psychologists, um, is, predicts lower empathy of therapists towards black clients and blaming black clients more for their psychological um, problems. Um, we also know that colorblindness is associated with more racist treatment of students and with um, perpetuation of inequities in the first study that I know of by a social psychologist in schools. Um, and from Valerie Purdy and her colleagues, we know that colorblindness can provoke minorities' distrust relative to multiculturalism. Why do I have this in red? Well, it's because it's an important bridge to the research that I'm about to show you. Um, what I would like to find, what I wanted to find out in this research was what are the implications of colorblind and multicultural beliefs for actual minority outcomes in a setting that is occupied by both majority and minority individuals? Um, I wanted to do this in the real world. Um, that there's not, I don't have a problem with college student samples, but I wanted to do this in a real organization. And I wanted to know whether colorblindness is associated with what I call a toxic climate for diversity and multiculturalism with a flourishing climate. Um, this is an organization of over 10,000 individuals. We got a pretty good response rate for this kind of survey, 4,900 individuals. Um, organization is highly skewed to white, 79% white. Um, it is not in the South. I can't tell you where it is, but it's not in the South. Um, previous research shows that a lack of inclusion leads to, this, is, um, this was animated on my Mac, but it's not anymore. So lack of inclusion leads to psychological disengagement. We also know from previous research that psychological disengagement among employees leads to lower productivity, lower profits, and higher turnover in organizations. Therefore, this is the outcome we chose for our study, psychological disengagement of minority individuals in the organization. Okay, so um, what, is, what is psychological engagement? Psychological engagement is defined by organizational psychologists as um, something like doing well in my job tasks and duties is very important to me. I am proud to tell others that I work at this organization. In, or, in other words, it's not just satisfaction with one's work, but feeling connected. Feeling connected both to one's work and to one's organization. Um, colorblindness, we were very limited in the number of items we could put in the survey. It was a diversity climate survey that we conducted for the organization. Um, so, uh, the mo oh, multicultural is first. Um, multicultural beliefs, organizational practices should support racial and ethnic diversity and employees should recognize and celebrate racial and ethnic differences were two of the items. Two of the colorblindness items were employees should downplay their racial and ethnic differences and the organization should encourage racial and ethnic minorities to adapt to mainstream ways. I recognize that this is just one aspect of colorblindness but it's an important one because it's the assimilative aspect of colorblindness um, that often is so oppressive. Um, and then just to remind you what we're looking at here is the association of whites diversity beliefs with minorities psychological engagement in each work unit, in a department, and we have 18 departments in this organization. So just to illustrate our hypotheses, if you have a department where people are thinking, we should downplay dis difference. I don't see race, I see people for who they really are. Everyone should assimilate to the dominant culture. Race and ethnicity don't matter. I don't care if you're black, brown, purple, or polka dot. People are all, are all the same. We are all one race here. It is American. We're beyond race, we've got a black president. <laughs> then you can imagine that that sets up a certain climate for diversity. Um, a climate where it's not um, too difficult to imagine that um, people of color in the department might start to think, my work isn't important to me. Or might start to feel like they don't like to be there, like they don't like their job. Or that they don't feel connected to their organization. Now, on the other hand, if you have a uh, department where people are thinking we should celebrate difference, and bear with me here on these, let's have a potluck. <laughs> <laughs> we have to pay attention to difference. Our differences are good for business. There's no such person as polka dot. <laughs> Race and ethnicity matter. Maybe we should do things differently around here. Um, whoops. Our differences are good for business. Maybe we should value different ways of being. You can imagine that their um, uh, uh, employees of color um, in their department might think, my work is important to me. 
I love my job, or maybe I like my job, and I feel connected to my organization. Um, now, the reason that I put um, let's have a potluck up there is there are many different ways to do multiculturalism. And multiculturalism, I agree with Miguel, can have severely bad consequences. And I do research on this myself. I'm not going to focus on those um, right now. I'm not going to focus on the fact that they can have consequences like um, burden of educating, uh, consumption, fetishizing um, was brought up earlier, um, uh, threatened backlash, pigeonholing of employees. Those are all negative consequences. For now, I'm just going to focus on colorblindness is bad, multiculturalism is good, and let's see what happens. <laughs> This is the relationship of whites' multiculturalism with minorities. Uh, this is, they're supposed to be a, um, min this is minorities' engagement on the y-axis. This is the relationship between whites', whites multiculturalism and minorities' engagement by department. The blue dots that you see are different departments in the organization. As you can see, as whites' multiculturalism increases, so does minorities' engagement. This graph maps white's colorblindness against minorities' engagement, and you see the opposite pattern here. It's a little bit weaker, but I actually think that's because we had fewer items in our scale, not because it's a weaker effect. Um, these, I should say, are very, very strong effects statistically. Um, and what you see here, again, is the opposite. As white's colorblindness goes up, um, minorities' engagement goes down. Okay, so here's the pattern with that against each other um, with the reverse effect for multiculturalism as for um, colorblindness. Now, um, importantly, these effects hold even when we control for numerical representation. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that numbers don't matter, um, as we've seen before in at least two of our presentations. But what it does mean is that numbers alone don't cut it that we actually also need to pay attention to the climate surrounding diversity and that that climate may in fact be shaped by these important ideologies that we're discussing in this wonderful conference this weekend. Thank you. So much food for thought, I must say. So what I'll do is ask each of the panelists a question, which I won't actually um, invite them to answer directly, because I do want to get your questions on the table as well. But if I could just throw the following few questions out very quickly. Um, so Professor Boeing, I'm hoping that you might say something about how you see your research, your current research, interacting with uh, Professor Bunzuetas. And I'm thinking particularly about whether you're troubled by the possibility that operationalizing diversity could in fact involve a selection mechanism by which you're looking for not the truly disadvantaged, but the truly diverse, right? And so what are the implications of that for your work? Uh, selecting the really, really, really black over the not truly black. So I'm interested in hearing what you think about that. So, uh, Professor Goff, I want to hear more about police training. And so I'm wondering to what extent you think diversity training in the context of policing can actually be good. So the story you told us about the extent to which it's bad, what institutional form might diversity take in that particular domain to produce better results? Do you have a view on that? Um, Professor Weinert, I want to give you an anti-racist wand. And with it, I want to ask you to work some magic. And the magic is to produce your anti-racist world. And the specific question I want to ask you with respect to your anti-racist world is, is race cognizable at all in that world? That's my question uh, for you. Um, Professor Unzueta, so I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on the normative implications of your work. And so part of what you describe, for example, is the extent to which there is um, uh, a dynamic involving people conceivably doing extra work in order to embody a diversity that the institution expects. One could imagine the flip of that, which is to say an institution that's structured around color blindness creates incentives for people to subordinate 
their identities. So you could conceive of what you might call a racial double bind. Either you're expected to work your identity vis-a-vis -vis diversity, or you're expected to subordinate your uh, race, work your race in that way vis-a-vis -vis sameness. Um, which one of those are better or worse? So how should we think about the fact that both of them could be operating? And um, finally, Professor Plout, I'm interested in hearing about the dichotomy that you recognize does not, in fact, exist, which is to say the diversity equals good and the colorblindness equals bad. To the extent that you know that diversity equals a good and bad, and colorblindness equals good and bad, I want to know what your sense is about the policy implications of that. Right? So how can we as lawyers think about util utilizing this discourse if it seems to be going in both uh, directions? So those are some questions that I want to put on the table for you to pick up as I uh, take a couple more from the floor. Yeah. So I, I want to ask, an, I guess, a narrow uh, methodological question to uh, Miguel. So, uh, in your study, it's really interesting that the uh, stereotypicality, the traits that you pick, basketball, hip-hop dancing, surfing, and country dancing, arguably are valence neutral or valence positive. And what you did on the DB was likability, right? So what would happen if we picked, for example, valence negative stereotypes? So African-American as not being intelligent, for example, right, or not as intelligent, and, and vice versa. And what if you measured not whether you liked them or not, but instead whether you agreed with the stereotype or not? So could you tell a story that multiculturalism, right, that priming, would lead people to reject the negative stereotypical attribute, uh, even though, and, and that might be entirely consistent with what you saw in this particular context. And so the whole concept of valence accuracy seems to be really important. So I don't, I mean, people could misread your studies in lots of ways because of what you were measuring and the things that you were controlling for. And so I wanted to hear um, the possibilities of devising stereotypes, particularly negative stereotypes, particularly negative intellectual capability stereotypes of underrepresented minorities. All right, so we'll get some responses. Sure. Um, so, uh, past work that has used those exact same primes uh, does find, uh, as um, Professor Plot mentioned, that uh, multiculturalism relative to colorblindness does tend to increase people's use of stereotypes. However, those stereotypes have been found to include both sort of positively valenced uh, uh, characteristics and negatively valenced characteristics. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I guess the way that relates to your question, we, we actually thought about um, trying to include uh, more negative stereotypes. However, given the context of a Facebook profile, I, I find it hard to believe that somebody would uh, present a less than favorable perception of, of themselves on there. Uh, <laughs> 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 like That's being true. dumb and committing crimes. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I, I do think that uh, if, if the stereotype were, were, or at least the description were, was negatively valence, perhaps we would have seen, if you noticed, all, all my effects were a boost to liking, not really a decrease in liking. Uh, perhaps a, a negatively valenced uh, description may have led to disliking as opposed to only boosts in liking. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is certainly an avenue that, that, that we need to think about more carefully and, and, and hopefully actually conduct some, some research on that. Okay, Howie on the magic wand before I take another question. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite children's book ever. Okay, I definitely want to answer this question, but I just want to say, I have this feeling that I might be on the wrong panel. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I, I, I would make this criticism of my own field, sociology, as well as of uh, the sociology of race, as well as I would make it of uh, psychology, but it's, it seems to me that the questions that are being debated here are largely the same questions that have been in place for the past 50 years. I mean, the original debate in ethnicity theories of race was between uh, assimilation-based and uh, cultural pluralism-based theories. Um, are we a, a melting pot or are we a salad bowl? You've all heard that. And, you know, and, and my, my problem with that is that, and, and you know, I'm definitely not trying to cast any asparagus on what is obviously really good research here, but, uh, uh, but what, my problem with that is that we live in history. 
we're in a very different moment politically than we were then. And I mean, that's what I think Kim is talking about when she talks about ground zero. I think that's what we're talking about when we talk about a transitional moment in po in politically. So that's, you know, I think that's a tension in this panel at least, or at least maybe a tension in this conference between what we're doing around colorblindness. Are we looking at something that is basically a kind of a social scientific process that might have some re ramifications for uh, and, you know, uh, civil rights law and so on, or are we looking at a political process that uh, is about movements and how the how uh, the law as well as general political life can be uh, organized to uh, intervene in a progressive way about it? Okay, sorry about that digression, Devin, but I had to do that. Um, in terms of my anti-racist world and my wand, that also this also came up in the last panel because. The question was, uh, what is post-racialism and all of that? And I think that's sort of what you're asking here, too. Uh, it's, uh, it is race cognizable in this quote-unquote post-racial world? I don't think there's such a thing as a post-racial world. I don't think there's such a thing as a post-racist world. I don't, th you know, I think it's, it's necessary. I'm giving you a wand. Oh, okay. I, 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 <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm, I'm, getting, the I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I think it's, just to finish that point, I think it's necessarily utopian. Just as Marx was utopian to think that there could be a class of society, or Mar Marge Piercy was utopian in her n novel, Women on the Edge of Time, to think you could have a society in which people dropped gendered pronouns and referred to each other as per in the third person, for short for person. So I think it's uh, utopian to think that you can, we can get beyond a race. But the, what, what I think, what we, that does point to uh, something positive that we are doing, which is we, ca we can move to uh, generate structural differences in our society, which, in, which will affect, positively affect the uh, deep disparities and inequalities that exist and which will validate the differences. So that, um, and, and this is not something that we have no experience with historically. Again, we live in history. This has happened in the past. There are all sorts of formally racialized, stigmatized groups that have achieved much more, if not entire, equality. There's all, there's all kinds of um, violence against others of different kinds that has been uh, eliminated or much reduced. So I think it's, po it's quite possible to imagine a situation. I mean, think of religious difference. Think of the history of nativism, the iter various iterations of know-nothings and so on that have taken in place in the past. We can do a big historical thing. So I think it's very possible to not to wave our magic wand, but I, obviously to mobilize ourselves in different ways um, to uh, uh, begin to efface the most striking elements of those disparities, injustices, and uh, oppressions. I, I'm good enough answer for you. It's an answer that we'll accept. Um, Professor Goff, you had a response. Well, yeah, so I actually wanted to push you on answering the wand question in a different sort of way, because I think that the answer I'm hearing from you is um, that in whatever world you would create, um, it wouldn't be post-racial because that's not possible. Um, I, I wish that people would listen to us, when uh, us being academics, when we say that something's not possible, but far too people, few people do. And so the answer, it's, we shouldn't because it's not possible, is different than an answer that is, we shouldn't because it's undesirable. Because that end state, that ideal theory, would be a bad place to be in and of itself. And I, I, I'm wondering whether or not you, with your reluctant use of your magic wand, um, <clears throat> would create a, a, a utopian world that would be post-racial. I mean, that would be not post-racial because a utopian world would have to take account of, of racial categorization. That that would be a necessary part of human existence um, that would just have sort of different valence and different outcomes attached to it. And the reason that question is important to put on the table, it seems to me, is because we always have questions about getting to some end without thinking hard enough about what that end might look like. And it's true that it's an act of utopia to some extent, but it seems to me it's worth thinking about the limits of our racial imagination. Yeah.
So th- I think that's a fantastic question, um, and as is my want, I will respond with a story that also includes research. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I have a, a, a more humanist uh, colleague and friend who does brilliant work, uh, Sritha Srivastava, um, who's at uh, King's uh, University, or Queen's College. But there's royalty and it's in Canada. Um, <clears throat> but she does research on anti-racism and anti-racist movements usually within um, white liberal organizations, particularly within feminist organizations, right? Um, and so we did a data collection, um, particularly on crying. Um, and I, I'll explain as simply as I can. Crying, on crying, tears, tears, tears. Um, <clears throat> right, no, and, 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 this is, and, and the story, uh, I'll get to policing in a second and the expertise, and, but I think the, answer, the, the short answer is they're the same. And here's how I, how I get to there. Um, so we uh, took uh, essentially interviews, we, uh, we had them fill out some surveys, essentially talking about, all right, when have you seen crying in the organization? What's the most common? And uh, what we see from the non-whites who are involved in the feminist organizations that we spoke to in Canada is that all of them say it happens when race comes up and our white female colleagues are responding to a threat of being seen as racist with tears. Okay. Um, and we find that unbelievably debilitating and, and counterproductive in the sense that you're not supposed to respond harshly to it, but we see it as a form of racial oppression because they're responding to us being in pain and us being victimized racially within the organization by a, a, a socio-emotional signifier that they themselves have been victimized by something, right? And so if we then respond, then we're being mean and nasty and we're victimizing them and yada yada. So. <laughs> And I'll, I'll tell you more about the, the rest of the research because it's a lot of fun. Um, but, <clears throat> so, so, so first of all, there is some research that, that's being done on exactly that. Um, but I think the interesting story and the, the reason why I said the short answer is it's the same is that there's, I mean, much like there's no crying in baseball, there's no crying in cop work, right? Um, but we talked to our, when we did our interviews with our African American and Latino and Latina officers, we said, okay, so when do you see shows of emotion? Well, you see shows of emotion in all different kinds of ways, but it's usually happiness or rage. When do you see crying? Well, it's, it's when race gets brought up and there are female supervising officers, white female supervising officers. It's the same in these organizations. So I think that it's a myth that cops are somehow there to do evil. Right? At least most cops jo- get on the job because they want to do something good like, that's, that's generally valued as good. It's, it's similarly a myth that people are like, I don't know what I should do. Should I go into a nonprofit or should I worship Satan? Right? <laughs> that's not the choice they make. Right? They've got, well, I've got loans and maybe I can do this and I'll do some good you know, uh, service work on the side. And then after they paid off their loans, they're like, but my service work, I should be nice to myself and so I should buy the BMW, which is going to require more. So, I mean, the corporate world is not so different from the nonprofit do-gooder world of us wonderful progressives as we would like to think, I think is, is one of, the, at least my, my summary answer to that longer story. So now I have to give uh, the panel an opportunity to say a few things so that we can transition to a closing. So why don't we start from this end of the panel. Um, Just on that last question, I had a very quick response. I think the answer um, is narration. That is to say, go back to this thing I was trying to say about self-reflective action being uh, situate, si- situated and creative within your situation. If, if, if um, as systems can be created, if norms can be created, if uh, politically conscious work is going to be done in those organizations, I think it's going to be about uh, creating opportunities for people to tell their stories. And a lot of times I think that means writing their stories. When, they, when you write down what's happening and when there's some organizational way of processing that material, that, um, that means uh, that people will come to some greater awareness, not only of their own si- <coughs> situation and its dilemmas and contradictions, but of, of each other's. And I think that if, there, if the political will exists to process that nar- narration, Narration is around in everything. So I know it's a big thing in law as well. Um, that that points to a, a new kind of process-oriented politics that might make sense in your organization. Miguel, and if you could say something about the working identity vis-a-vis sameness versus working identity vis-a-vis difference as you close. Sure. Um, so, I mean, the, the first thing is, uh, as everybody uh, on this uh, panel, uh, this panel and also the panel previous, 
uh, either explicitly said or uh, implicitly uh, uh, said. Colorblindness does seem to be quite, uh, it's just not realistic given the, the reality of, of um, uh, sort of the multicultural world that we live in today. But that said, I think the uh, multicultural ideology, at least the way that I described it uh, up, up in the study, when you look at the way multiculturalism is, is, is talked about um, out there in the real world in, say, corporations and even universities, it, it tends to be all about the, the wonders of difference and the difference in cuisine and, and the fact that we all wear uh, different outfits based on our ethnic group membership. And that is a, a good thing, but I, I wonder if we can do more uh, when it comes to emphasizing multiculturalism. And I think that more could be actually talking about uh, entrenched social inequality and uh, uh, power differences uh, that uh, are reproduced through institutional uh, uh, forces as opposed to just focusing on the surface level uh, on the stuff that's easy to see and easy to value and I think if, if we did have perhaps a third or a, a, a different way of thinking about multiculturalism perhaps we can move this debate forward uh, from say the melting pot and, and, and the salad that you were referring to to something else something more meaningful um, that really will allow us to to uh, to perhaps truly integrate uh, the society and these kinds of organizations that we're um, associated with um, and again if you can engage the question of the screening possibilities as a function of different manifestations of diversity absolutely um, in, in response to that question, Devin, I would also um, add um, that I, I tell students that we, we don't have a melting pot, we don't have a salad bowl, we have lasagna. And um, that, that's what we need to come to terms with. And, and what I'm saying with, with lasagna, um, my, my, my Sicilian grandmother you know, just makes lots of layers. And so there's a, there's a racial hierarchy, but there's some oozing that tries to make us feel good, that maybe some people get above and some people get below. But fundamentally, we're, we're still in a racial hierarchy, and, and, and that's, that's a problem. Um, so um, in, in hearing um, uh, Professor Anzueta's uh, research, it concerns me when I situate it within um, my work. And, and here's why. Um, when, when, we're, when we use multiculturalism, um, and, and perhaps we, we often are, are guilty of using it interchangeably with diversity. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about diversity as consumption. Um, and so if we end up um, in a situation where we have affirmative action to the degree that we're going to be educated about a diverse person's experience, um, then we end up with curriculum diversity. And I don't think that's why um, we need affirmative action. Um, because then we just are inviting people of color to perform for us. That's a type of minstrelsy that we don't need at all. Um, on, on the other hand, I do think if we think about diversity in the way that it was intended, that Charles um, Lawrence suggested that we need to go back to thinking about it as a way um, to redress um, past discrimination, which nobody wants to talk about anymore because we don't get anywhere with that as a, as a, lit as a legal discourse, um, then perhaps we can start dealing with the, the lasagna piece. Um, and, and to that end, diversity that creates critical mass so that individuals are in the classroom not as um, pieces of the curriculum, but as individuals who are free to engage um, the institution as they see fit and then create a social status as they see fit. That's the kind of diversity I'd like to see. Thank you. And Victoria, and again, if you could help us think through the policy implications of a discourse that says diversity can be good and bad, colorblindness okay. can be good and bad, is there a net gain at the end of the day? Okay. How do you do the math? Well, first I want to say, Howie, I have um, data on racial denial. So we should talk. So we do belong on a panel together. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have similar problems um, that I stated before, and also as Miguel stated just now, with, and um, Dieter also about multiculturalism and that it doesn't push issues of power at all. And I actually, in my early work um, on this, used to try to use different terms for that model and used to put power in there and inequality in there. And my social psychology peer reviewers kept pushing me to use multiculturalism. So it's interesting how that 
uh, framework just keeps getting um, perpetuated. Um, and so I, I'm really glad that you said that. And, and as you can tell, I'm very uncomfortable with the with the dichotomy. Um, in my work, though, I've decided to use it to have something to compare color blindness to, um, so that at least I can make that point um, that color blindness can have pernicious effects. Um, with respect to policy, now this is my weak point, um, and probably many of us social psychologists, not all, but many of us, um, I would say use multi utilize multiculturalism or whatever you want to term it um, with caution, um, with great caution, um, for reasons of consumption or potential consumption, um, for reasons of pigeonholing, pigeonholing um, minorities into certain roles in the classroom and in employment. Um, and, um, and by the way, in economic downtimes like this, those pigeonholed roles are the first ones to go. Um, so there are many reasons to be careful with identity conscious policies, but we do know that identity blind policies, um, uh, well, as we know in California, can have very serious consequences for participation. Um, we also know that identity conscious policies can inst instigate um, threat, a great deal of threat, among white Americans who um, still have a great deal of power in institutional life um, in this country. What I also know is that um, in my kind of naive view of Title VII and equal protection law, um, they're very ill-equipped to deal with issues of climate, um, right? They, and, um, and probably, well, I know, also help to perpetuate the pernicious effects of colorblindness. Um, so I, while I can't give you a policy that, that, you know, to use, I can say to proceed with caution. Thank you. And Phil, so you'll have the last work, and I'm hoping you'll say something about good diversity training in the domain of policing. Is that possible? Yeah, but I need Howie's wand. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I, I want to continue this sort of trend of, of trying to reclaim Howie for the panel, because um, uh, I, I think that... Uh, no, he tries to get away, but we keep pulling him back in. Um, I, I think that, that uh, the answer, and I'm, I'm heartened to hear it so clearly um, from essentially everyone, is that um, the way that you do, would good, do good um, police diversity training is the same thing that's missing from a sort of a more full uh, conception of multiculturalism, is the same thing that um, is, is sort of dangerous about the, the direction that post-raciality is going, which is that we need to have an explicit conversation about history and power. Right? I just like to marinate in saying the words over and over again because I never hear them when we're talking about race. Right? Um, so when we talk about diversity training, it is the only you know, multi-million dollar industry in the United States that I can think of where no one has bothered to test whether or not there's a product. So you can give a diversity training and no one knows what's happening on the other end. What, what happened? Well, I, I asked them whether or not it felt good and most of them said yes and a couple people shot up the rest of the black colleagues they knew, but it was fine. It was... <laughs> Um, and so, much like diversity trainings anywhere, it would be very good if there were some outcome measures, and I'm, I'm happy that we're doing some pre and post stuff now, and it's not just doing pre and post testing, we're doing some tweaks to the actual diversity training to see if we can't educate officers about issues of racial history, and particularly racial power, right? But I, I think short of that, and then testing to see how you get that to stick, and how you get that to, to then be predictive of the positive outcomes, and you know, negatively correlated with the negative outcomes, until you start putting that into place, you know, we have no mechanisms um, right now to even gauge the effectiveness of this dialogue, um, in the, from the narrow to the, to the broader. Well, please join me in thanking the panelists.